and welcome. You saw that right. Frankie's got a big mouth. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about big issues and big conversations about what's happening, not only in cities near you, but around the country. The great big topics that are important to you each and every week, wherever you grab your podcast, you want to make sure that you save this one and join me for these conversations. A lot of people to thank. We'll do that on the back end. Let me be real clear out the box. What we're going to talk about today is what we're dealing with, not only around the country and major cities, but in small towns as well with the crime rate exploding in even little wealthy towns like Highland Park, Illinois, where people pay millions of dollars to be what we call safe. We're going to talk about those issues. We're going to talk about inner cities like Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago, Camden, uh, New Jersey, uh, L.A., where the violence is off and out of control. But we want to start as well talking about police stops. Does it make sense now that residents are saying stop and frisk is something we'll deal with to curb crime? And whether or not you believe that a curfew for teens matter. I'll just say this as a footnote. When you look at the numbers and the ages of individuals that are being uh, arrested for these crimes, yes, we see an increasing number of violence with young people. But a number of those people as well are not teens. So is that fair? We're going to talk about that along the way. But first, I am so excited for you to meet my guest. And it is so um, good to have them on the very first show of Frankie's Got a Big Mouth, brought to you in part by iHeartMedia and Real Times Media as well. And of course, LinkedIn with the Black Information Network. Let me start to my left, right, left corner. He is a political consultant, former union representative, and a political strategist. Deron Marshall is joining me. Thank you, Deron. Thank you for joining me for this edition of Frankie's Got a Big Mouth, and I don't want you to say a thing. I did this, uh, this amazing uh, podcast. All right. To his right, um, one of the premier defense attorneys uh, in the country, uh, welcoming to the show and uh, always a part of my radio show as well, Attorney Shaka Johnson. Welcome to Frankie's Got a Big Mouth. How do you like that? I, I like it very much, actually. Um, you know, I like it very much. I want to thank you for having me um, to lend to the, to the conversation nationally uh, my opinion on things. Thank you very much for having me. I promise to be an asset. Great. We're going to go back around as well. Let me just give you an opportunity as well um, to introduce yourself to the audience. Should I start or, or should you? You, you can start. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, uh, as, as previously mentioned, um, you know, I'm an attorney in the city of Philadelphia. I am barred uh, in many jurisdictions, but I call Philadelphia home professionally uh, speaking. Um, you know, I was a previously in my, my former career. I was a police officer. I did that for over a decade. Uh, I went through the ranks of narcotics uh, detective. Uh, that gives me a different perspective, quite frankly, in my current career. Uh, I mm -hmm. have a degree of uh, forensic medicine from the Philadelphia School of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, that gives me, again, a different perspective when dissecting and synthesizing information regarding these cases. And so I try to be as well-rounded and, and, and went and got the educational tools to be as well-rounded as possible so as not to be jaded uh, because of the position I currently sit in. All um, right. Again, thank you for having me, Frankie. Absolutely. And that's why I enjoy so much having you as a part of the conversation. Deron, let me come back to you as well and give people a peek into who you are. Well, again, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this discussion. I'm always enamored when I'm uh, a guest with these amazing attorneys. So I'm going to bow down as a political science major. I'm a poli sci major. I'm from the city of Detroit. Um, uh, actually, I'm a, Na I'm a United States Navy vet as well. Um, um, uh, as a bit of fact, I served on the Enterprise when they filmed Top Gun in 1985. I did radar systems for F-14s back in that day. I, I went on and got my undergrad, uh, Morehouse, graduate degree, Berkeley, poli sci, um, went on to uh, got out of the Navy as a disabled vet, decided I was going to join the Postal Service. It was a good gig to get. I ended up being the president of the Postal Union. I'm the, I'm the first federal union president in the history of America to negotiate a union shop agreement. I then went on after I left the Postal Service, 
got involved in um, after being involved in several successful litigations on behalf of the union. I also um, started working for Congress. I ultimately retired from Congress for 29 years um, of my full pension. I was the chief of staff. I was a district director. I, um, I, um, so I'm very proud of being able to bring home uh, $790 million to the city of Detroit during the period of time I was there, along with a whole bunch of positive legislation to help people. So I have a broad perspective. I love people and I love representing people. All right. I thank you for that. The attorney, Kier Bradford Gray, is joining us. Thank you so much, Kier. Thank you for joining us for our very first show. I can't wait to get into the topic. First of all, welcome to Frankie's Got a Big Mouth. I love that. <laughs> thank you so much, Frankie, for having me. And I'm telling you, um, my titles are not as colorful as the guests uh, at the yeah, before right. me. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, um, in the roles that I've held, which has been mostly in the criminal justice system, both state and federal, and I've run those uh, systems, uh, be small county and large county, as administrator, um, my impact has been really to make sure that I hold the system accountable for the very freedoms it promises, but also to advance public safety in a real way. So we're going to talk about what it is and what it looks like uh, when we're talking about the justice system in, in public safety and some of the performative public safety that we see that I'm sure stop and frisk is falls right in right under. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Shaka, always love being here with you and so nice to meet Same. you. Same. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Shaka, I'm going to start with you. You talked about as well working in law enforcement. Uh, Kira, you've represented as well a lot of those people underserved. We've had this conversation many times, Deron, as well. I want to start first with um, but driving while black, right? Uh, particularly for black men in America. We saw just recently 60 shots Um in Akron, Ohio, Jalen Walker, of course, the initial conversation by the police officers in the report uh, was that they heard shots coming from the car to later say that was, in fact, not the case. But he was fleeing after being pulled over. Um, I always thought that it was so interesting how to get pulled over and what you should and should not say or do when being approached by police. Shock, I'll start with you. And then, Kira, I'd love to hear from you. Just how to engage the police as a black American or a person of color in this country. So that is a question that has actually several answers, right? It has several answers. We won't have time to give you them all, but it really is very situation based. But I think as a general rule, um, you know, I find it interesting how police qualify nervousness as something um, they, they, that's for them as the trigger, that something must be a foul in the vehicle. There's a reason to go further with this investigation because of nervousness. Um, mm -hmm. Having been a police officer and uh, uh, knowing how to talk, you know, I, I know how to talk. Okay, I, I can talk. Yeah. Um, I still even experience nervousness. I know how to deal with it. I can mask it. I can cover mm -hmm. it. I can I train myself. But the average citizen, the average civilian probably experiences a great deal of nervousness in what is called a routine traffic pullover. What I would suggest at the outset I call out, I read and I call out names, names. When a police officer knows that you are paying that kind of attention, don't ask what's your badge number. That's received as confrontational. But I say the name. You know, officer asks you, you know, Officer Jones, mm -hmm. when you say that, it lets them know you are recording, mentally speaking, you are recording in your memory who you're dealing with and the level of service you're receiving from our public servant. Now, that sounds like a very simple and sophomoric sort of uh, piece of advice. But I am telling you, mm -hmm. having been the person standing outside of the driver's side window, myself collecting driver's information, it just lets you know you're dealing with a, a, a motorist who is probably a little bit more advanced and knows how to go through the processes of complaining, filing a written complaint, and letting the powers that be know if you display misconduct. And maybe it's all, maybe it's completely wrong, but it tells the police officer, this person isn't my average bear. Yeah. I should probably conduct myself a little bit better. That's a, right. just a, a, a simple thing to start with. Well, you know what, Kira, and, and I got to tell you, there are a lot of folks that are out here riding dirty. Right. Mm -hmm. License is expired. Right. Driver's right. license uh, registration is expired. Mm -hmm. What is it when the officer that you would suggest as well? And you've represented, you know, a lot of folk. What should they do? Should they comply or in like this case and in a number of cases where it becomes combative? 
So, you know, compliance is always where you want to be because you want to live to tell the story and want to live to make sure that someone tells the story on your behalf. Um, but, you know, look, one of the things that I said, and Shaka laid it out pretty well in terms of how you're, you can conduct yourself to know, so officers can know that you are more sophisticated than the average person. So if something goes awry, they will be on the hook. However, I do think tra the officer's training needs to include real life situations, right? Understanding of how people feel when they are being stopped, how people feel when they are being questioned, or how people feel about the demeanor of the officer should be factored in as well. And many courts and even uh, training in, in uh, police officers' uh, experiences do not factor in nervousness as a real feeling for people in communities of color who have experienced some negative impacts from police officers or visualize it all the time. These things don't just come out of left field. Someone just doesn't feel nervous for no reason. Now, of course, you say when someone doesn't have a registration or, or a certain license, then may, they may be feeling even more nervous because they don't know what's going to happen now that they don't have these things. But the acknowledgement that, okay, you don't have these things and a, a discussion about either why or what you're going to be doing is something you can try to have. Uh, but at the end of the day, take the ticket, make sure you make note of the officer's name. Um, and if, if you can, very discreetly, just put your phone and record the conversation in some way so that there is some record of the interaction in the event that it goes awry. Um, you know, most people, your word against the cop, it's hard. It is very hard. These days, uh, jury is a little bit more sophisticated in understanding that officers don't treat everyone the same in an encounter. But I tell my, my son to say things like, officer, I don't feel comfortable. May I ask, may I call my mom? May I call this person? Because he's a young motorist. Um, or saying, if the officer asks to pull, you, you know, you step out the vehicle, officer, can I ask why? I don't feel comfortable. Is there another person I can speak to? Saying those words, I don't feel comfortable, are triggering for an officer to know you need to either tone it down because you are now doing something to make the person feel very nervous and intimidated. All right. Uh, Duran, did you want to add to that? Because I think I know I've been pulled over before as what I consider a fairly educated individual and have felt very intimidated. And I just got through the ticket, took the ticket, tried to have a conversation, didn't and literally left that traffic stop and drove straight to a precinct to try and uh, do a police complaint. And let me just say to you, prior to being able to do it online, when you had to go to the police precinct where in the states where I've lived, you could go to any police precinct, not that particular one where you may have gotten pulled over and right. try and do a report on another officer. There are there were officers at that time that tried to dissuade me from mm -hmm. doing that. I literally had to put on my radio voice and they're like, wait, that sounds like Frankie Darcel. It is. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> and then I right. was able to get a response. But I recognize <laughs> that everybody's not Frankie Darcel and everybody does not have a radio show. That was the only way they took that report when they realized mm -hmm. who I was. So a lot of officers don't even want you to put in a complaint. But Duran, you say what? No, I, first of all, I think that the advice that was given by uh, by both um, your guests were excellent. Um, Shaka always gives a great advice. And now I'm learning that uh, your other guest does the same thing. And I'll just say this, you know, as a black man and as someone who's been involved in the policy world for a long time, uh, for over two decades, um, this is more of an issue of how the, the comfortability, number one, that the officer has with stopping people in certain communities. So you got to get back to why are we allowing certain officers to patrol community when they're uncomfortable with the people? Got to start there. If an officer is scared, that officer is bringing tension to the situation. The individual is already scared because they've seen so many situations because of YouTube and so forth, encounters that go wrong. You know, I think that you have to be able to survive the stop. So it's important for you to think, to act like someone's watching, act like his camera's on. You know, you're going to play to that judge. You're going to ask those things that would be reasonable and then and, and it, let the unreasonableness happen with the officer. That's mm -hmm. not with you. This is not a time to fight the officer or to give him tension or I'm going to chest him down. No, you survive the stop. Take your name, take the number, badge number down and go to the precinct. Go to the precinct and file the report. What happens with so many minority um Motorists, they don't follow up. They don't go to the precinct. They don't follow the report. They just get mad and tell their friends. And so nothing ever happens. In other communities, and whether it's, you know, minority or so forth, if it's, they, they complain. And those complaints 
the tick, the, the pick, the reasonableness so far of the officer moving forward. All right. So let's talk about stop and frisk. In a number of cities, we saw what happened in Highland Park. We saw what happened in Buffalo. Um, we're seeing what's happening. You know, I mean, you're talking about a parade and a grocery store. Citizens are saying after watching news, newscasts every day, I'm really kind of Fannie Lou Hamer sick and tired of being sick and tired on this crime issue. So if one or two people that, you know, who have done nothing gets pulled over, it's time for us to stop. So this whole idea of stop and frisk has started to come up again in cities like Atlanta and Charlotte and the like, particularly in cities uh, where there's a large number of African-Americans. Kira, I'll start with you. Um, is stop and frisk a good idea? So there's two different types of stop and frisk. There's the legal stop and frisk that has actual legal indicia of some reliability and credibility. And that's the 1% of things that make it into court where someone actually had on them some contraband, I say contraband, which is anything illegal that the officer has noticed before stopping and frisking them that they believe this person is either carrying something or up to some criminal behavior. That's 1%. And the reason I say 1% is because, you know, I was involved in a study of stop and frisk for motor vehicle stops in the city of Philadelphia in 2019. We looked at 309,000 car stops, the reason for each stop, who was stopped, and what was the return on that stop and frisk uh, in, I say, investment, how long that stop took. And what we saw was out of 309,000 car stops, 78% of those were of black drivers. Of those 78% of black drivers, 70, 72% were stopped and, and at some point the car was searched. Of those searches, they only found something 0.17% wow. of the time. So that wow. means each time they re reviewed a person, their actions and believe I had to stop and search or frisk and stop and frisk is, is a little, gets into searching sometimes. It's supposed to be a pat down of the outer body. But when it comes to a car, officers are searching in the cars. Uh, so this was in an understanding that, wait a minute, this exercise, this tool, this policing tool was actually not bringing us closer to public safety because 99.73% of the time they were incorrect about their assessment as to who it is that they were going to stop and search. And so what it looked like it became was more of an exercise of racial profiling, biasness, and get lucky. If I search enough people in a certain community who are already devalued, who already don't stand a chance against me, officer of the law, because of my right. stature in the community, right. and I get lucky, no one is going to care because they're going to see this as a viable policing effort that keeps them safe. When I know, based on the data that matches my intuitiveness, that this is a performative measure of public safety and actually a very waste of the resources and a real uh, destruction of the relationship between officers and people in those communities who feel, who are otherwise law-abiding citizens who have felt put upon. And one of the things I hate that we do is we get very reactive and emotional in, in trying times instead of being real mm -hmm. thoughtful and critical about mm -hmm. what policing should look like to bring public safety to bear. And so when you're talking about eroding people's rights, it's okay to erode people in communities of color's rights, but save the Second Amendment rights in the name of public mm -hmm. safety. And it's mm -hmm. a lopsided ideal. So right. for me, I think we have to be much more thoughtful uh, and, and intuitive about this situation. Very good. Shaka, two. I two was looking for my more. Bible. I'm looking yeah. for my Bible. Yeah. I was. Right. I, I know I got one in my office <laughs> somewhere. All right. She, she said it. She said it. That's that was, right. That, was a, That's that right. was a grand slam. Bases were loaded. That I couldn't have said and that. You, and exactly and Shaka, right. you, as a defense attorney, you deal with these kinds of things all the time. It, what is it then when we talk about stopping frisk and is it a good or a bad thing? Your thought on that issue um, and based on um, some of the statistics that Kira was talking about. I, I mean, it's I think it is it's not a necessary evil. It is not a necessary evil. I think that stop and frisk is uh, exactly as Kira just said, something that we have instituted in the past that yielded a certain result. We can look at recent history. We don't have to go far back. Uh, before the Civil Liberties Union in New York sort of spearheaded the movement and it was uh, declared unconstitutional in New York before it was repealed in uh, 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 Philadelphia, you know, this was the sentiment. High crime, what do we do? Ah, let's stop and frisk. And then we saw how it was being implemented. 36 short months later, 
we're back having the same conversation because there's a spike in crime. We can't possibly think we're going to get a different result when by and large we have the same police officers policing the same communities, except now they have a uh, the, an invigorated spirit with respect to minority communities because there's mm-hmm. a, a sudden real spike in crime in minority communities. So you can only expect it is going to be instituted the way worse than what it was in 2019 in New York and 2014 and 15. So yeah. it is a terrible thing. I, I don't think we should even be having the discussion. This is a frightening time when I hear us talking about mm-hmm. eroding the constitutional rights of citizens right. in the name of solving some crimes or stopping some crimes or being proactive. It is very frightening. Well, you know, and people would say, the people who live in inner cities or major cities across the country don't want any more crime in their neighborhood than anybody else. But something has to be done. Then what would you recommend relative to the spike in crime? We get it. We want to protect, you know, constitutional rights and we don't want people in minority communities to be harassed, but we want the crime to stop. What is are we asking those people? Are, are we asking <laughs> though? Are we asking the people in these minority communities? Right. Do you want to be stopped and frisked? Because right. every time we say people are saying, are we talking yeah. about the select population of people who will That's be directly right. affected by these stop and frisk laws? Ask them. Right. Go to go to the go to the barbershops and the hair salons and the and the right. corners or the jails or wherever you That's think right. the 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 the, the, the the gravamen of your population is and put a survey out amongst those people and ask them, <laughs> do you care to be stopped and frisked? Do you care for right. your sons and daughters and husbands to be right. stopped and frisked? I, I, right. I suggest yeah. the answer would probably be an emphatic hell no. Yeah. Listen, so Duran, <laughs> this, what, this, what happens? What, what do we do terrible, This is a terrible situation because uh, maybe these two esteem um attorneys can tell me how do we reform a police force and a police force mentality that started with the plantation police. That's where this entire police system started. And if you look at your history and you look at how they patrolled the plantation, it was under the same scenario. Well, I'm going to be the angel's advocate, though. I'm going to be the angel's (laughs) advocate. I get that. And I I agree with you. But it's our cousins in the community that are creating some level of havoc. How well, I'm not when you saying, look across I'm not saying, the country? That's correct, but but when you look at a community, if you look at some uh, area of uh, I'm in Maryland, you look at some area of Baltimore, and you say, you know what, I have a problem in this area. The problem is is that most of the people in that area are under siege as well. If the streets are a problem, they got to go to work. They so go why to do school. we continue the conversation yeah. about protecting people's constitutional not, rights, which them. gives you're, which gives Pookie and them the opportunity to run rampant through the community? But, but, it, but it really mm-hmm. doesn't. It's actually lazy policing. Because how about mm-hmm. you go after Pookie Thank and them you. instead of stopping my mother, instead Thank of stopping you. my grandmother, instead of pulling over my son, instead of pulling over my son and then treating him like Pookie? He never yeah. shot anyone. He has mm-hmm. his information. Why is why is a simple stop elevated now where he's got a gun pointed at him when all he did was said, officer, why are you stopping me? Because you're thinking of him as poopy. Right. See, the problem is, is right. post-traumatic stress as a veteran, post-traumatic stress disorder is so deeply in these police departments untreated. We, it spills out to the to the streets and the courts tend to be on their side because the people that vote say hey, we just want that eliminated. We've not progressed. And the reason I asked the question initially is, is because the plantation police was the fundamental basis of the policing department. We don't pay them much. We don't, we ask everything of them. And we've now asked them not even to live in the city, to live way out somewhere and come and police people that they were scared of when they went to the grocery store and steal. Our problem is, is the fundamental problem of policing. And if we don't want to have that broader discussion nationwide, we're going to have these pockets of problems that will continue. All right, Shaka. Can can we add something? Yeah, go ahead, Kier. You hit the nail on the head in terms of lazy. I mean, and and I'll say this, untrained, right? We're still using the same tactics uh, dealing with the problems that have evolved. Right. Why do we have police? Why aren't we being more sophisticated in terms of technology? Why are police learning how to do more investigation in cyber, into cyberspace, into the mm-hmm. world where people leave a blueprint on what they're That's doing, right. where they're going to be and who they're going to be with? I mean, mm-hmm. these are tools that needs to right. evolve with the changes of society. And we're still doing this. Uh, stop, frisk them all in these communities and get lucky. I mean, this yeah. is Barney Fife world for yes, right. That's right. We're not That's in right. the same world. Yeah, we need That's more right. better police tactics, better mm-hmm. police trainings, and to use our resources and our tax dollars wisely 
So for things that actually advance public safety, not give me a facade of public safety. That's right. All right, That's right. Shaka. I agree wholeheartedly. I think it's a very draconian and Flintstone method of policing. And it's sort of just like uh, uh, very Flintstone, very, very right. Barney and Wilma. Uh, ask okay. in nature okay. uh, when you're talking about just casting a wide net and shifting mm -hmm. it out in court. Mm -hmm. And and like you said, you will, at some point, you will separate the Duran's sons from the yep. Pokies and That's letting right. that process play itself out, which is not right. police investigation, quite frankly. That's right. That's All right. right. So listen, That's we're right. going to make this transition in this show. Of course, welcome to uh, Frankie's Got a Big Mouth. Love my guests, Deron Marshall, yeah. attorney, as right. well, Shaka Johnson and Karen Bradford Gray, talking about stop and frisk you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it all. Is it or is it not a good idea? I'm pretty much hearing from the three of you that it's absolutely not a good idea. And I always want to bring a resolve to the conversation as well. If stop and frisk, and I'll start with you, Kara, as we wrap up this first portion of the show, if stop and frisk is not a good idea, you made reference as well to investment and training and police departments not a good idea, I'm thinking I'm hearing you say, but what is the alternative and yeah. maybe what should happen? So I I, I want to make sure that we have something straight. Stop and frisk as a legal principle is not going anywhere. Police still have the ability yeah. to be to have exercise some common sense. But when mm -hmm. politicians stop talk about stop and frisk, they talk about it as a social concept. Stop right. people who you think may have something. That can right. never be a recipe for success. Do what you feel is necessary, no matter how, no matter what the data shows that it's not working. So I would suggest police departments start reviewing all of the stop and first practice like I did in my office. And I use the police data to do it and see, are we actually advancing and moving the needle? And if we are not, let me look at officer why. Why are your stop and frisk data numbers so low? Meaning if you are stopping 100,000 people and only finding something on 10, what is it about your perception? Right of these communities that I have to now deal with and work on and make sure that you have better training so that you're equipped to do the job as we need you to do it, not as we have seen on TV in terms of giving me a, a you know a colorful understanding of what you're doing. So I'd say monitor the data in police departments, making sure that officers who are out there exercising stop and frisk, one, any department that doesn't have data needs to start collecting data on it so that it can be monitored to see how effective it is. When mm -hmm. it's not effective, you can start to peel back the layers of the onion and start figuring out why are your uh, stops so high and the return on that investment so low? What mm -hmm. are you looking at? What are you basing these things on? And now I have to deal with your perception. And mm -hmm. if that perception is pervasive, now police departments, you guys have to have better training options and tools that really address the roots of why this bias police policing is being able to take over versus actual policing. You know, I, I love the concept of this show. Frankie's got a big mouth. We're talking about the big topics as well. Today, yeah. focusing on the issue of stop and frisk, my guest, uh, attorney Kira Bradford Gray and attorney mm -hmm. Shaka Johnson and political consultant and strategist Deron Marshall. As we wrap up part one of this conversation, join me each Monday for the continuation of this conversation, which will be next week. I look forward to you joining me because we're going to continue the conversation, adding mm -hmm. to it the idea of curfews. So now we're going to curb crime by telling kids they have to be in at a certain time. My name is Frankie Darcel, and we'll be back. So listen, I want to continue the conversation part two of the stop and frisk. You can always go to iHeartRadio. You can also check out Real Times Media or wherever you get your podcast, both audio and and video. Great conversation. So I applaud you to go back, look at the first part of the show to understand where we're going in the second part of the show. My guest turning, uh, joining me is political consultant and strategist union representative, Deron Marshall. Thank you again, Deron, for joining me. I appreciate you being here. Yeah. Yeah, Attorney thank you, thank you. Shaka Johnson is also joining me. Attorney Johnson, hello. Hello. Thank you for having me again, Frankie. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Attorney Kira Bradford Gray, thank you for joining this conversation. Hey, Frankie. Thanks so much for having me as well.
Listen, we talked about in part one of this conversation, the stop and frisk. And when we left off continuing that conversation, we'll come back to some of that. But Chuck, I want to start with you in cities across the country to help curb the the violence. And we've seen the crimes and the whole ghost gun idea and guns in communities uh, Mm -hmm. of color uh, and the numbers and the ages are younger and younger and younger. Um, But when you watch the news, you hear that some of these individuals are 18 and over, which they're now adults. Is it a good idea that many communities have said that there is now a curfew and city councils have moved this needle on this issue that all kids during the summer months now through September should be in by 9 p.m.? Is that a good idea? And then what are the repercussions when these individuals, these young people are arrested. So let's start first with the question, is a curfew for teens a good idea? And are we really reprimanding our young people and holding them accountable for the violence in our communities? Number one, yes, we are, I think, at some point holding them as a class almost uh, responsible for all of the misdeeds that are currently going on nationwide. To, the, to, to answer your question straight away, do I think it's a good thing or a bad thing? As it has currently been laid out, as the question is currently being posed to the, to the nation, I think it's a bad thing. I don't like the way it rings right now because it has the uh, potential to have the same disparate impact on minorities, quite frankly, that in part one when we discussed uh, stop and frisk, the same level of disparate impact because it is being enforced by the same police departments. And I can almost assure you that it will be unevenly and uh, 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 carried out through the minority mm-hmm. communities. We talked a lot in part one about the training of the police officers as it relates to car stops. We talked a lot mm-hmm. about in part one about the, uh, the training of police officers in terms of how to implement the stop and frisk and looking at the data. But as it relates to curfew, I can assure you it's the same issue as stop and frisk, wherein uh, in part one, Duran it said it, I think, very plainly, it's an issue of inherent bias. So if you have the same police officers with inherent biases that they're patrolling with, the same way in which I call foul on 99% of the stop and frisk, I will be calling foul on the overwhelming majority of these curfew violations. And I think that in tandem with, you know, this illusion that we need to stop people to be preventative in terms of crime, I think criminalizing behavior just from being a citizen. It automatically criminalizes your behavior, whether you are on the way home from a study session, on the way home Mm -hmm. from work, you're going to your aunt's house to get a plate, like whatever it is, it is automatically criminalized by virtue of you just being alive. And I don't like the way that feels. And I think it's going to be unevenly uh, uh, doled out amongst our community. And I see issues with it forthcoming, the way it's currently being spoken of. All right. Now, city council members, and you guys jump in at any time. Oh, uh, can, can I say to... one thing more, Frankie, yeah. about, about that? I'm, I'm very sorry to cut you off. But as soon as you said city council, that's the problem when politicians <laughs> talk about things on the heels yeah. of major events. You know, right. you bring these issues yeah. up about curfews and stop mm-hmm. and frisk after people are shot in, in, on the parkway or on a parade on July 4th, after people are gunned down on South Street. Right. Uh, uh, during, you know, uh, and even not with family on a crowded, busy street in Philadelphia at night. Uh, when things happen in, in, in Los Angeles and Chicago was rife with crime right now, the same way we are here in our city. On the heels of those things, the sound bites are right. curfew, stop and frisk, these, these right. catch-alls, and they're not right. really synthesizing any data. They're just talking. Right. So That's when you it. say city council, that just immediately, you know, shot my yeah. meter up about that's partly the issue. If people would stop responding out of their mouths so quickly and just playing tennis, something happens, we talk about it. Something happens, we speak on it. Wait a second, process yeah. information, yeah. receive and process data yeah. and come up with right. a plan. Otherwise, mm-hmm. we're just paying, as my father would say, lip service. <laughs> you know, Frankie, so can I, can I yeah, here? you can. And I want to throw in here. I'm only being the angel's advocate because I hear people right. that are That's watching right. this and and That's and right. listening to it through the audio as well on their favorite place for podcasts. But right. what then do we do? Because Pookie and them are causing problems. Go for it. 
Here, here, here's, here, here's the problem, and I'm, I apologize. I, I will defer. Uh, if you, I just want to make this point to 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 the to Shaka's overarching point. You know, bad policy is reactive. Yes. Uh, uh, we have a bunch of politicians who are plaguing to the public. They don't know good policy. They don't do good public policy. They, you, you know, I'm a poli sci major. There's a history to public policy. But it's these not, people not look just happens. like you and I. But, let's but let's come problem. on. Let's here's, go for it. These the are people. So Shaka right. says. So Shaka says, Jerron. Right. You know, it's going to affect most people of color. It's people of color that are actually introducing this kind of legislation I that know, are sitting on your city council. But, but because the because the political environment has allowed these people to be um, um, to be BSers on the public stage. For example, when we when when nine eleven occurred and the buildings blew up. Everyone says, you know what, let's stop all Arabs. All. They, they were yeah. stopping Arabs on a plane. They were How successful was that? Because a few weeks after that, we had a terrorist attack by a young white guy who walked into school and killed 20 people. We, 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 when we do these emotional, non-intellectual decisions based on playgating to the public, it's bad public policy. No, no public man. policy should occur yeah. right after a shooting. Really? That was things in place. The shooting that just happened in Texas with those little kids, you would think a change occurred after Newtown when we watched those little babies' bodies get riddled up. But nothing oh. happened because at the end of the day, politicians play toward the emotional behavior of people versus good public policy. If we want to do good public policy, we should do it now before there is an issue. Mm -hmm. And good public policy requires us to be thoughtful. And you're not thoughtful when you're saying, oh, you know what? Let's just, you know what? How about we stop all black guys because one black guy did a crime? Well, under my belief right now, because a white guy walked into a, a store in, in New York, how about we stop all young white guys at 18 years old? I mean, I don't understand what's the, what's the evaluation. And if people think this country believes, the majority, that that's bad public policy, it was bad public policy to pull over all Arabs. It was bad public policy. It is bad yeah. public policy to defame uh, all African Americans as, as criminals or something. So we need to do good public policy, which means it's thoughtful. It happens ahead of time. It's deliberate, and it allows everyone to get yeah. into the conversation, not in the yeah. middle of an emotional situation. All and right, Frankie, I mean, it's, I, I'm spot on, um, Shaka and Duran. Sorry, uh, because one of the things that happens is the the quick reactive type of policy always plays out against those who a society feels are more disposable to Absolutely. those types of things. You want something done, I'm going to allow you to do something that impacts disproportionately communities of little value in my right. world. So that That's could right. be in areas that they have more homogeneous communities. That's that can right. be in communities where people are mm -hmm. just low income and at the bottom of the food chain. Whatever that is, those are the people that are going to be impacted the most when times of crisis are because we don't do more deliberate thinking and we don't have yeah, leadership yeah. that has vision instead right. of reaction. And everyone That's accepts right. the fact that leaders can't have, don't have time to have vision because they're too busy reacting. Not true. One of That's the things right. that I do appreciate, mm -hmm. I do think could work because I'm an old school person too. Mm -hmm. You know, I have children. And if you're under 17, what you doing out in the, out, out in the streets at 11, 12 o'clock at night? That's However, right. as a yeah. city, you have to be prepared for that. What do you right. have available for young kids who have parents that work right. evenings and don't have that structure? What do you have available for those people that are making right. sure that they're getting to A to B? See, there's some 17 year olds that's got to work themselves to help uh, bring in income into the home. Right. And that may be until 12 o'clock at night. So really understanding all of the different scenarios and who are you targeting and what resources are you using? What training are they using? And making sure you're doing no more harm than necessary. Mm -hmm. Some of these kids that are out there on the right. street have already been disinvested in. You That's have right. to understand that. You're not out there pumping gas at 10, 12 o'clock at night because you got a mother and father at home waiting to put dinner on your table. That's not the scenario. So let's make sure we have the supports and the understanding of who we're targeting, reasons why, and how to funnel them into other helping hands, especially those parents that are making trying hard to make ends meet. For whatever mm -hmm. reasons, they can't be home with the little kids all the time. That's mm -hmm. a reality. And, and, and Frankie, have, can I ask, can I ask Karen? Can I just, let, let me just say this one thing. Okay. Let me just mm -hmm. let me say this one thing. Because a lot of people, police, politicians, whoever, start to look at communities based on what they think a community should be versus right. what it actually is. You start That's figuring right. out what it is, right. then you start having more thoughtful approaches.
All right. my, my one question, because you were on a roll, and I apologize for cutting you off, uh, but my one question is, where's the, where's the man force to, 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 to enforce these curfews? You, right. you barely have enough police officers and a budget to be able to man some of the uh, uh, events that go on and also take care of the community. If something's right. happening downtown, you don't even have police officers in a certain part of the community. So who's going to do that? Where is that budget coming from? Every idea right. has an economic value to it. So if you're going to say, make sure all the no, kids no, are off the street, to. who polices that? Who's but responsible? You know and who, who, and here, let me ask you this last question. And if they're not, who do you prosecute? So what, we're going to put more so black people on paper? Prosecution shouldn't even be a part of this scenario, right? <laughs> right? Because we're talking about kids and getting yeah. them into things that will be more right. healthy for their yeah. for whatever it is they're doing rather than staying on the corner. But we got to really understand the realities. First of all, you need some credible people in those communities That's that right. can help deal with kids yeah. who are out on the corners, right? Mm -hmm. And some right. of the corners, these people live in row homes. There's a three-bedroom right. row home with seven kids. Everybody right. ain't sitting in that hot house That's in the right. summer. They are going right. to go outside. So that's what right. is it that you have available mm -hmm. in West Philly community that's open right. evening hours, after mm -hmm. hours, that's proactive, mm -hmm. productive? That's mm -hmm. what you need to set up in these communities. And you don't always have to use police. You can start right. to really engage communities in a better way, pay them for their time and right. effort. Because if community people want to really improve the quality of their communities, they got to mm -hmm. look at what's going on for their children and the youth to do. If there ain't nothing to do, then ward leaders, you're not advocating for the right things because you should have been right. advocating for things for people in your community with, with the needs of those children from day one. Not when there's a summer crisis. All right. I tell you, I tell you the answer to your question. You said what's open. Uh, unfortunately, the jails they're wide yeah. open, and and yeah. and that's and that's the right. the, the angle mm -hmm. from which they're coming. What is closed are the libraries are closed. Are, if right. We're talking about summertime. The public right. pools are closed. Okay. The rec centers yeah. are closed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, and and, mm -hmm. and even the park. The park don't even have the park right. don't even have basketball Light. rims in that's the park. Right. It doesn't even have that's you right. know where people can go and and, and, and proper lighting. Yeah, comfort lighting. Yeah. What I'm right. suggesting yeah. is the criminalization of just existing. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that I listened to both of your points and I, I, I it resonated with me. I don't know, Kara, if we can do a if this can be done without police, because they're talking about right. criminalizing it. Having should, police right. Officers, but right, right. it should not be. But that's the discussion, which is this why is I a said service I, issue. I, it is. And that's why I said at the onset. That's right. the problem. How do you right. you're talking about criminalizing just you she living? Yeah. Right. Just you living. Now, doing now it. okay, again, I'm not trying to be the devil's advocate, but I gotta right. throw this out there. I'm the angel's right. advocate. But okay. do, do and all of us are parents. Um right. the level of responsibility that parents have. I, I do absolutely agree with each of you, you and your points. And Shaka, I think I even heard you kind of alluding to this, is that through this policy, and Jerron, you talked about it coming up with other ways to criminalize the behaviors mm -hmm. in the community. And Kiara, you talked yeah. about yeah, the parents yeah. who have to work and great mm -hmm. that there's seven kids in a house. It's in the middle of the summer. There's no air conditioning. What do you expect right. them um, right. to do? But is there still too a level of responsibility that parents have to be responsible for not having their kids out in the street and the community creating havoc. I will share this with you as well. One of the officers stated to me as well, and especially in some suburban communities where restaurants and gas stations, unless you're within a quarter of a mile, but like six blocks or so of a freeway, that they shut restaurants down to be able to police. So what does that mean? The poppy store, the convenience store, the liquor store on the corner closes at 10 o'clock to stop the loitering and, and the like so that they can have police deal with calls. But mm -hmm. what level of that as well, and we get it, in challenging communities, people are doing the best they can with what they're working with. And they're looking at prosecuting parents on the second violation when that mm -hmm. child is picked up and arrested and they got to come down and get them. Well, what about those parents that I mean, because look, when you start to add prosecution, now you're going to deal with a whole bunch of different things, right? Because I mean, when the kid is out, they're going to arrest them, right? If they break curfew, what are you going to do? But you're dealing with so many social issues that this right. should be a service. This should be a social yeah. issue yeah. versus right. a criminal issue. Look, there are yeah. some parents that just are not good parents. Understood. Right. There are. Yeah. 
Some of them are too caught up in their own mental health issues right. or their own dependency issues or their own depression right. issues that they can't be good parents. They were never right. parented themselves. But there are some people that are just struggling to make it all work. And you can really weed that out when you're starting to deal with people and get an individual understanding and assessment of what's happening in each of these neighborhoods. Right. If I got seven kids and it's just me in this house and I right. got to work night and day and this and that. Right. Well, why isn't there, you know, midnight swim for my kids? Right. Where there's, right. the, you know, where PAL centers are open at, after 10. Because if I need a mentor for my children, because I can't do it, I got too much. Daddy's ain't right. around like that. Right. I don't have any other village. Where is my village? And that's what we need to start figuring out. How do we create this village with this opportunity for this curfew op issue? And it shouldn't be for just a kid that's walking on, walking down the street, minding his own business. We're talking about chronic issues that come from people sitting on somebody else's step because they ain't got nothing to do or these right. other things, real issues that de degrade the right. quality of life right. in some yeah. of these communities. What right. is available for these yeah. youth and what can yeah. I start to engage these parents who may not know that their kids yeah. are out like that. They may leave 18 year old in charge, 18 year olds on the phone all the time. Real life scenarios kick in. Yeah. And I've seen so many different scenarios of people coming in through these systems with all kinds of, 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 of of needs, all kinds of issues that still have not been addressed because we address everybody in such an, uh, a, 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 you know, borderline way. We yeah. right line rule everything. And so we can't have, you know, different alternatives for things that we need to. Criminalization should never be a part of this. Help social, mm -hmm. social and, in, 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 uh, social in nature, but also learning. This is where you start to understand the complexities of these communities and these households and start to put things in place that help to deal with them. All right, Duran. So, so oh, so, 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 so I'm sorry. So let's get this right. We're not going to prosecute the young lady, the mother who gave a gun to Kyle Rittenhouse <laughs> and who then goes and shoots. We're not going to prosecute her, but we're going to prosecute <laughs> the parent of the child who's on the corner. Who hasn't committed a crime, you just want them in the house. Yeah, they're, they're, again, bad public policy. So, for yep. example, Frankie, you know yourself, you took your and, and, and was blessed to put your daughter in a wonderful school, high school. Um, and, you know, and she did great. She performed in that high school. But when there was a conflict, and also my, my wife and I did the same. But when there was a conflict in that high school, guess what? When the police did show up, they never took the person in. They never made a report. You know, and see how connected this is. They would say, well, we're going to call your parent. We're going to do something different. But if you go to a lot of the inner city schools, that kid's going to the jail and there's a report and that's in their folder. So what, we're, what we seem to be doing is when it comes to minorities or people, we can't intellectualize their problems. We're going to put them all on paper. So that parent that gets put on paper, guess, they, guess what? They get fired from the job because in their job, it requires them not to have a record. If they, or they can't even they can't get a handgun. They can't they, like they can't be involved in society like others because their kid was out on the corner. We got to reinvent this. This should not be a policing issue. We talked about psychologists. We talked about other things. This is time for the municipalities to hire a force of individuals other than the police to deal with social issues that the community is partly responsible for creating. When you right. push money into the police and you take it away from the rec center, when most of the rec centers are broke down and got asbestos in it and you've never removed that, when you don't care about that, then when you cut that first in the budget, now you're sitting up worrying about where the kid is. Well, you should have worried about that That's when right. you cut the budget. Yeah, you know, the correct. problem is it's the principles and priorities right. are all backed up. All right. Great. Shaka. <clears throat> Frankie, this reminds me of when we used to very publicly uh, criminalize mental health and That's use right. the criminal justice mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. because we had nowhere else, I guess, to funnel these uh, people. We used to use right. the criminal, I say used to like it's over, but we used right. to publicly, we used to right. publicly do that, use the criminal justice system as a vetting process and as a, mm -hmm. a, a, a way to deal with folks with real life, non-criminal, but mental health issues. I don't know where to put him. He's incarcerated, but he's better mm -hmm. here than he's out there because here we feed him outside he doesn't eat. We're using right. jails to deal with social right. issues. Yeah, this yeah. reminds me of mm -hmm. that. Just like Kara said, I find mm -hmm. this, just like she did, and Deron did as well, to be a social 
issue that That's I'm right. not suggesting it does. I'm not saying stay out of our business, stay out of our, right. out of our community's <laughs> business. Right. I'm saying right. before you invite yourself, understand us a little bit more. That's and then right. you're real. And then we have to have, that's one issue. And then that's next right. to that is we have to have some mechanism that's not criminal in nature that doesn't yes. produce all the subcategories right. that that's dealing right. in the criminal nature pr produces. Right. I, I'm not a guy who really focuses on numbers uh, like this. Duran, he uh, seems like he does <laughs> in terms of the funding and the resources. But, right. but the, the amount of taxes I pay, it, it, it makes me wonder right. where, right. where some right. money is going. <laughs> and when I see, you're going to have right. to create additional courts, Frank. Mm -hmm. You're going to have additional courts. Yeah. Lawyers. Almost going to be yeah, like so, yeah. almost like social courts. Because right. when you criminalize this, I'll tell you this. I'll be honest. It doesn't always mean necessary jail. It could be a, right. a citation. It could be you know your parent has to appear at a hearing right. and and explain themselves or explain right. why you were out at this particular right. time. But there's a hearing master or a commissioner or someone who presides over that. That mm -hmm. that courtroom has to be staffed with people. The right. police That's officer right. has to come off the street to testify right. to. To bringing you in on that particular evening so it's a it, it will be a financial issue you'll find overtime for cops it, it just yes. it, it right. will be the fi finances right. are going to be poured into this to a magnanimous right. degree and right. again we're talking about kids walking around with yellow stuff falling on their head and, and, right. and, and inside of our old buildings right and we're talking about millions yeah. of dollars for yeah. being out after nine it just yeah, yeah. I don't, don't, don't right buy in here if jail is on the table, most people will have to now start. You have to figure out: Do they have a right to an attorney? Is That's this right. where people That's can, right. you know, potentially have an a, a adverse reaction or action by the, the system that does this? But one of the things I like to say, based on what these two brothers are talking about, we're talking about the system of our government being more constructive than destructive. And when you're starting to really understand all the collateral destruction that bringing people in the system where these are not criminogenic issues. But all the itch, all the consequence that treats them as criminogenic and therefore uh, really underrise their opportunities to having or achieving generational wealth or anything right. of value because we have stuck this label on them that they cannot get rid of. That is a government that is not working effectively for what we need. Okay. We need okay. people to understand yeah. the destruction mm -hmm. that this yeah. system is and have better remedies for our social issues than that. Yeah. That's an easy yeah. That's, a, that's like the Band-Aid approach. That's you right. know, I call it like just the tip politics. You know, you know you're going to go far. Right. You know you go far. Right. And I call it longer, whatever I'm right. calling it. But you know, we all right. know what that means being, being this age. Right. You're not just going to stop there. Then you're going right. to start going big, long, you know, further and no, further. Right. And then where does it stop? And next thing you know, now people have these labels on this back, this scarlet right. letters on the right. back that they can't get rid of. Yeah. All right. So as we get ready to wrap up part two, this is the second show. Uh, Frankie's got a big mouth talking about the big issue with my big guests, big ideas and big solutions as well. I'm going to go around, give you about 60 seconds on both the first and second part of the show talking about good or bad ideas. Just to reiterate your position um, about the stop and frisk, good, bad idea and curfew. Good, bad idea. Duran, I'll start with you. It's a it's a bad uh, cur um, um, the curfew and the stop and frisk bad ideas bad public policy. Let's look back the the, the issue of curfew. My mother and, and the people on the block made sure we got in when the street lights came on. We're asking police to do that without the resources and with the, and with weapons. Uh, it changes the dynamic when anything occurs. Um, so as we did in the first in our first series of discussions. Public policy is important when it's done in a deliberate way ahead of time. This reactive public policy may feel good to citizens, but it also has long-term ramifications. So every action of equal and opposite reactions, the law of physics. If you push here, there will be something else that happens here. The unintended consequences can't continue to fall on the minority community because the majority community wants to fool themselves into fake safety. All right. Kara. You know, I always I had I developed metrics for any justice system approach to public safety. And that was one. Does it make good use of taxpayer dollars? You know, is it you know, if it costs, but it's effective. Hey, let's keep doing it. Is it racially unbiased? Meaning, does it have a disproportionate impact 
on one group or another? And three, does it actually advance public safety? If it doesn't meet those three prongs, why are we doing this? We right. really need to yeah. evaluate it from those sensible approaches, not reactive, like we were saying, not just to show, hey, I'm doing something. I didn't pay you. We didn't hire you to do something. We hired right. you to be effective. And That's so right. all of these things we're talking about are cyclical, right? We've mm -hmm. been here, done that. Why do we keep talking about the same failed approaches? So, uh, you know, I'm just going to piggyback off of what Deron said, but also put those three plugs in myself. All right. Great. Right. I appreciate yeah. that. Right. Attorney Keir Bradford. Great. Attorney Shaka Johnson. You, you know, there's a school of thought amongst a group of people that they should not pick black jurors because black people mm -hmm. are incapable of saying the words mm -hmm. guilty if the defendant is black. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, ridiculous <laughs> okay. as that notion is, there's a school right. of thought that, that suggests you should discriminate against black jurors because we can't find a black defendant guilty. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that is because Sometimes, mm -hmm. even in my position as a as a black man, first and a defense attorney, second, you almost expect me to say uh, stop and frisk and the curfew is bad just because that is sort of my right. line of work. As if I don't have children or a wife or right. family members that I want to keep right. safe Thank walking you. around right. these same exact neighborhoods. Right. I want them to right. feel comfortable going to and fro That's into right. the city and doing their business and uh, going to a, a, a July 4th event. I want my family That's to right. safe as anyone else's, white, black, mm -hmm. Asian, doesn't matter. I want my That's family right. safe the same way. But I do have an opinion. So mm -hmm. despite the fact that I'm a defense attorney and despite the fact that I'm a black man and a father, my opinion happens to be that on the issue of curfew and mm -hmm. uh, the stop and frisk, those are as currently presented bad mm -hmm. ideas. They are bad That's ideas. Right. Stop and frisk really because we've done this before in recent history. So we are really perpetuating and living the actual definition of insanity. So mm -hmm. I want no parts of it. Right. I just want no okay. parts of it. You know, I don't want to be like I dream okay. genie and I like, go back in time and go back in time to do what failed a few years ago. We're doing the exact right. same thing. Yeah. Uh, so for all those reasons and all the statistics that support mm -hmm. that those uh, were bad decisions, I say I double down. They're still bad decisions. As far as the yeah. curfew, I think that is just uh, a horse all the same, but of a different color. And I think that we yeah. ought not uh, uh, institute the curfew for all the reasons we just said in part two. I think that we're going to wind up in the same place again right. as currently stated. If someone mm -hmm. promotes something with some with some data, and some right. evidence that this data right. was uh, uh, gained in a neutral environment. T talk to me. I I I'm willing to listen. But as currently stated, no go. All right. Great. I love it and cannot wait to continue our conversations about issues that are in the news every week. And of course, those things that people don't know about. So I want to thank you guys for joining me for this first edition of Frankie's Got a Big Mouth talking about the big topic with my great big guest, um, Republic. Well, I was going to say Republican. How about that, Duran? Oh, wow. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> the hey, strategist, I, 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 political I strategist. So you know, you I've know, always thought I, that some of your either. views were a little left, but that my yeah, apologies, <laughs> my apologies, right, political strategist, <laughs> union representative, um, and of course, political consultant, Jerron Marshall. Thank you for joining me. Also, thank attorneys, you. Shaka Johnson and Kira Bradford Gray. Thank you both. Thank each of you for joining me for this edition. Um, you can watch and hear uh, Frankie's Got a Big Mouth on the iHeartRadio Network, wherever you listen to your podcast, of course, at Real Times Media and the Black Information Network. We're just getting started. Each and every Monday, make sure that you come back to wherever you get your podcasts and uh, check out the show. So until the next show, we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Frankie. Thank you. Love Thank you. you. Yeah.